Let's take a look at the central nervous system, chapter 9 in the Silverthorne book. Uh, here's a quick outline of this chapter. Let me just say this, um, trying to cover the central nervous system, the physiology, the function of the central nervous system in one lecture is a tall order and it's going to be um, somewhat of a, I don't know, incomplete job, I would say. Uh, so don't expect that this is going to be a well-rounded um, lecture. Uh, it's just going to pick up some aspects of the central nervous system, the function, certain sort of a functional anatomy, uh, mapping out certain areas of the brain uh, with the function roughly um, that they have. Uh, but it's not going to be in, go into much detail. We just don't have time in one lecture to cover that. Now, that said, let me tell you a story. It's the story of Phineas Gage. And um, he was a railroad worker working in the mid 19th century, laying railroad tracks across the United States. And as he was working um, in the rocky terrain, there was always um, the, one of the jobs was to um, use dynamite to um, create a path for the railroad tracks to be laid in rocky terrain. So one of the jobs was to put down dynamite into crevices of um, mountainous terrains, rocky terrain, and then um, explode it away. So what happened to him was that he was shoving down some dynamite um, down a crevice and he was pushing it down with that crowbar that he's holding in his hand, as you can see right here, this is his crowbar. And um, what ended up happening was that the dynamite exploded on him and the crowbar that he was using to shove it down the crevice it took this path through his skull. So it went here uh, underneath the zygomatic arch, destroyed his um, left eye. As you can see, he still has that, um, I don't know, this cover right there um, because the, the eye could not be saved. So it destroyed his left eye and then uh, went through the frontal lobe of his brain, exited um, the the skull right here, breaking through. That skull, by the way, is still um, it's like in a museum um, displayed. But anyway, so uh, you would think, wow, you know, this is a very big injury, and um, most likely this guy is not going to survive it. Well, he did. Um, in fact. Um, the storyline has it that he went to his foreman and said, oh man, this thing just went through my head and uh, I guess I should just go and see a doctor. And they, I'm sure everybody said, yep, that's probably a good idea. So he went and saw a doctor. They couldn't do much at the time. There was no antibiotics to save him from infection or they couldn't really do anything because at the time really nobody knew exactly brain function and they, nobody would dare to even think about like I don't know what, what can we do about this so um, he was sent home to recover and he actually did um, as it turns out let me show you this picture here it's pretty interesting from an anatomy perspective the path that this crowbar took through his skull and um, at any rate so the guy um, survived and recovered and uh, Afterwards, he had a changed personality. And so he turned from a responsible person who was well liked by everyone to a person that couldn't get along with anybody, was completely irresponsible, spending his money the minute he got, I, he got it, um, started drinking, gambling, and all the bad stuff, and got in fights with other people. So his personality had changed. Now that gave the first clue that the region of the brain that was destroyed in his case, so that would be here, the frontal lobe area, that that region of the brain is responsible um, behavior um, is basically your um, your ability to make informed decisions, think ahead about consequences, and um, being um, a good um socially integrated kind of person that can pick up nonverbal cues and uh, realizes when somebody finds something annoying. Uh, so those are people, they um using the frontal lobe to make um, good decision and show responsible behavior. So uh, nevertheless, um, this part of the brain got destroyed and uh, this is a famous medical case now that shows that um, certain parts of the brain have a certain function. And this was really the first medical case that was mapping a region of the brain to a specific function. 
Um, after Phineas Gage, um, there were many other studies that mapped certain brain areas to certain functions, and that's basically what this lecture is about. So Phineas Gage and his story, his medical case, um, sort of um, was the starting point for figuring out the functional anatomy of the brain. And then, of course, um, as you know, uh, there's much more known about the central nervous system, much more than, than we could possibly cover in one lecture. Uh, but it's a starting point, and so basically what you're going to get in this lecture is a, roughly a functional anatomy, certain areas of the brain and what they do, what their function is. So this slide here takes a look at some primitive nervous system like uh, in vertebrates like this jellyfish over here. Um, of course, very simple, just a nerve net. Then this flatworm invertebrate, just also very primitive kind of nervous system here. This fish has even a four brains, so there um, you get a little bit more sophisticated brain um, here in that goose. Um, that one has um, actually already a cerebellum and a four brain that you can see right there. And you can see that in the human brain, the forebrain is the largest and dominating part. Now quickly taking a look at development. So uh, the, as the tissues develop, here is day 20 um, and embryonic development, uh, 23. Let's take a look at after four weeks, you already have the three parts, uh, the forebrain midbrain and hindbrain. That will be sort of the, the skull portion and then the spinal cord here in the back. So you can already see the three big parts right here. They keep developing. Uh, after 11 weeks, you have you can clearly see um, the parts of the brain. And here, yeah, 40 weeks, that's at birth, um, the human brain, but this large forebrain, and then the cerebellum back here, spinal cord attaching right there. Okay, and here more anatomy pictures. Here would be sort of directionality. You can review that on your own. Okay, so moving on to uh, gray matter versus white matter. Uh, you might remember that from anatomy. Gray matter, those are cell bodies, and white matter, it's white because of the fatty insulations um, from these myelinated axons of so the fat. The myelin is white, and it gives the uh, the, the nerves um, that white appearance. So gray matter would be that would be the cell bodies, um, the dendrites also, and um, white matter. These are myelinated axons. Yeah, another anatomy view that you can review on your own. Um, the bone and connective tissue, so um, the, the cranium or the bony skull, that's the encasement for the brain. And the vertebral column, of course, is the uh, encasement for the spinal cord. And then we have some connective tissues, and there are three tissue layers that are protecting the neural tissue um, sort of they are the in between the bone and the actual neural tissue. Then we have three layers, uh, the dura mater, the tough mother, um, that one is a tough layer, and then the arachnoid membrane, and very fragile, the pia mater, those are the three layers that are sort of protective layers over the brain. And you can see that here. That will be um, showing you some of these protective layers, um, and you can review that. You might remember this from anatomy. Here, more enlarged, you can see the different layers. So the dura mater right here, the outer layer, then the arachnoid membrane in between, and very fragile right here, just outside the actual neural tissue, the pia mater. Moving on here, the cerebrospinal fluid uh, secretion and reabsorption right here. Uh, you can just review the slide, but there's not that much that we need to, to um, review for physiology. So uh, here moving on, the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus transports ions and nutrients from the blood into the cerebrospinal fluid, and here more up close kind of um, picture of cerebrospinal fluid reabsorption. 
uh, here, this is important for physiology, uh, this astrocyte here with its foot processes. So astro refers, it looks, has a star-shaped um, kind of appearance. And these astrocyte foot processes, they're hugging uh, these capillaries. And you can see that they're forming an extra layer, an extra protective layer, these foot processes. And that forms the blood-brain barrier. Now, the blood-brain barrier, the BBB, is important for physiology and also for pharmacology because it's a very selective kind of layer that... Um, decides what will get through to the brain, what can be absorbed, what can diffuse into the neural tissue of the brain, and what cannot. And it's a, it's a very selective kind of barrier. So if you're trying to get some medications up to the brain, it's usually difficult, especially when it's water-soluble. Um, Lipid-soluble stuff is much easier to deliver to the brain. But here you can see another uh, sort of cross-section right here. You can see this capillary here. These are the endothelial cells of the capillary. And then you have these uh, foot processes of the astrocytes that are forming the blood-brain barrier, an extra layer uh, that materials must pass through in order to get to the brain. As far as metabolic needs for the central nervous system, uh, basically um, you just need oxygen and glucose. Uh, the brain is very picky. It will only use glucose for um, its energy needs and um, aerobic metabolism, so of course oxygen, that we need, but uh, you cannot um, tempt your brain with different food sources. It's not going to run on fatty acids like muscle tissues could, but so we need to make sure that we have enough glucose, enough oxygen going up to the brain to meet the metabolic needs of um, the brain. If for some reason um, glucose supply is limited, um, that could put the brain, or could put you as a person into a coma that's called a hypoglycemic coma. Of course, oxygen, if oxygen supply is limited, the brain will shut down within a couple of minutes and, um, it's, and the neural tissue will die very quickly. So it's very important to get enough oxygen and glucose up to the brain for metabolic needs. Here's an, another anatomy picture, a summary picture on the central nervous system. And here another anatomy picture, cross-section of the um, uh, spinal cord. And here, I'll review quickly, the uh, sensory input into the uh, spinal cord comes here from this um, from the dorsal horn. So this would be, let's say, some sensory receptor that's sending a signal toward the central nervous system. So it will travel up here into the spinal cord via the dorsal horn, and then it could synapse here and go into ascending or des ascending tracks up to the central nervous system. Or if it's a reflex, it will just synapse from the sensory neuron and an interneuron and the motor neuron and then leave right out. So we had that in the lab covered as well. So if you have a reflex, then the sensory input, let's say from a patella tendon tap, uh, will go into via the sensory neuron into the spinal cord and then synapse to an interneuron. Let's label this one I, interneuron and then go out here with the motor neuron, so this one being the sensory neuron, I'm just going to label it as sensory neuron in, interneuron synapse, and then motor neuron out, and then you get the knee jerk reflex. Here will be a white matter in the spinal cord, um, the ascending and the descending tract. So here in green we have the ascending tracts that will transport information up to the brain. Now keep in mind, reflexes, they do not use ascending tracts. Um, they just stay on the same level in and out the spinal cord. But usually information does get processed. So once the sensory information enters the spinal cord, we're using ascending tracts to get up to the brain. And then here in blue, these would be uh, the descending tracts that sending commands down from the brain down to the executive areas. Yeah, ascending spinal tracts, something to keep in mind. Um, the nomenclature here, if you have ascending tracts, you are calling them spinal, and then you, whatever direction they're taking, let's say they're going to the thalamus, there would be a spinothalamic tract going from the spinal cord up to the thalamus. Or if it's going to the cortex, it would be a spinal cortical tract. So here on the descending spinal tracts, we're going to take the opposite direction. Of course, we're going from the 
brain down the spinal cord and a good example would be here the cortical spinal tract that means we're going from the cortex down the spinal cord or um, here another example here the reticular spinal tract so the name indicates the direction of the flow of information